Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you out here. It's good to see that after the afternoon siesta, you're here to hear about OpenStack, Ansible, and Ironic. So if you wanted to know about how to make bare metal deployments easy, this is the talk for you to be at. This is the talk for you. Uh, so, yeah, it's really great to see everyone. Um, wow, there's a lot of people, which is really, really awesome. Um, and hopefully some of the stuff we'll tell you you'll find uh, super useful, and, and hopefully some of you can get involved afterwards as well. Um, but just to introduce ourselves, uh, my name's Andy McRae. I'm the uh, PTL for the OpenStack Ansible project uh, for the Akata cycle. Um, there's our Twitter details and email address and IC. Probably the best place to reach us, reach us is on the OpenStack Ansible IRC channel on Freenode. And my name is Michael Davies. I'm also a Rackspace employee. I've been with the company for about four years, and I work from my home in uh, Adelaide, Australia. And again, uh, we're really, really happy for you to contact us if you have any questions uh, after the presentation. So a quick overview. What are we going to be talking about today? We want to tell you about the journey that we've undertaken to add ironic support to OpenStack Ansible. And it was a bit of a journey for us. Uh, we had uh, quite a few hurdles to overcome. But not just the journey we want to tell you about today, we also want to tell you about how you can try this out for yourself, how you might want to get involved with uh, the efforts that we've been doing and build upon that. We want to tell you about a couple of the limitations that we faced, and we also want to tell you about what we're planning to do next, and again, hopefully, to get you involved in that. So let's talk a little bit about OpenStack Ansible uh, to start it off with. Um, so what OpenStack Ansible is, is an Ansible-based deployment of OpenStack. It sounds uh, pretty obvious, really, when you look at the title, but uh, we're, not <laughs> we're not really in the business of coming up with clever names, um, <laughs> probably because we're not particularly clever. Um, one of the <laughs> differentiators is that um, the, the packages we use for, uh, for OpenStack are all built from source. So when you deploy Nova or Keystone or Glance, uh, we take the a Git SHA, we uh, build a, a pip wheels uh, Python package, and you then install that package. So there's no uh, you know, going to a vendor for packages or, or anything like that. Um, and we think that allows us to, to give you the code that the developers wrote the way they, they intended it to be uh, used. Um, and, and in order to ensure that you keep versions in, uh, in check and, and with the same versions, we actually have a repository server that these uh, packages then get uploaded to. So you can be sure if you were to deploy another Nova compute host, for example, you'll get the same packages that are on your other uh, compute hosts. Um, we utilize LXC containers um, and Python virtual environments. We do this to separate out uh, the packages, their dependencies, um, the various services that are set up within the environment. And it's just a good way to enable us to do some clever things around upgrades, some clever things around scaling, um, and just various other things for segregating out like dependencies. Um, and our main aim for the project is production deployments. Uh, we, we don't want to deploy the new shiny thing that might not work or might break. We want the things that you know are going to work, and we want, to know, we want you to know that when you use OpenStack Ansible, you can get a production deployment going. Um, it's actually, for that reason, the basis of the Rackspace private cloud powered by OpenStack offering that we have, the RPCO offering. Um, but I do want to make it clear, it's not, a, it's not a Rackspace only thing. We've got a really large community that started to grow. It's becoming more and more diverse every day. And if anything, the Rackspace involvement has, has slowed down a bit. Um, like we, when it started, it was entirely Rackspace. But we now have uh, developers and contributors that have come in from uh, various universities across the world, and as well as some really big uh, corporates that like, I don't want to name, but um, you know, they're all involved. And, uh, in, We've had really great feedback, and we've had really great input, um, and, and various people just adding new things to the project every day. So now you know why OpenStack Ansible. Now the question is, why Ironic? Why do you want to use Ironic with OpenStack Ansible? And it really comes down to the, the basis of why you would want to use Ironic in the first place. It's enabling the use of hardware-specific features. You see, when you deploy your node and you have virtualization, you may not have access to everything on the node that you'd have if you're just running straight onto the bare metal. For example, uh, it has uh, networking. You may, not, may have some uh, networking uh, capabilities that you, that you lose through the virtualization. Things like GPUs, if you're doing uh, Bitcoin mining or perhaps you are, are wanting to do video rendering, you want to use Ironic to deploy an image straight onto the hardware so that uh, you can make use of these capabilities. Uh, trusted computing modules, 
If that's important, you're going to want to use Ironic to keep away from the virtualization that you might lose. Uh, through that abstraction, you might lose access to the things that you want. And of course, the last one there is performance needs. If you're trying to squeeze uh, the last drop of performance out of your hardware, perhaps Ironic is what you want to use. The other thing is that adding Ironic in to OpenStack Ansible, it helps us to complete the deployment landscape. You see, when you think about OpenStack, most people think about virtual machines. You talk about hypervisors and launching VMs, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about KVM or Xen or any of the other hypervisors that are supported. VMs, that's what we think about typically when we think about OpenStack. But now we're, uh, we've heard uh, this morning and yesterday about how containers are now the next shiny thing, and so containers are great as well. But you throw bare metal into the mix, and all of a sudden you've got this uh, need for a computing resource, and you can have virtual machines through to containers through to bare metal. And depending on what your use case is, you can choose the one that's right for you. And the good thing is, is that it's sitting behind the one OpenStack API. So you can choose whatever you want uh, and, and, and uh, weigh up the whole performance versus cost needs. The other point I've got on there is uh, the undercloud. And it's one thing that we're finding is that sometimes organizations have got a large investment in applications that they want to run on top of, uh, say, something like Kubernetes or uh, Hadoop and big data. And they just want to run on top of a node. They don't want to use uh, necessarily the, um, the Kubernetes implementation in OpenStack. They just want to run their application on top of some nodes, and they really want to make use of uh, OpenStack as an IAAS platform, the infrastructure as a service. So by adding in Ironic support to OpenStack Ansible, you can deploy all of those nodes, and then you can run your particular workload on top of that uh, where it makes sense for you. And just to expand on those use cases a little bit further, if you're running uh, like a high-performance database and you're doing raw I.O., and you want to remove as much abstraction as you can so that you're getting the, the best database performance, maybe Ironic's the thing that you want to use. Uh, perhaps the idea of uh, having a single tenant hardware there is important to you. Maybe for security reasons or regulatory reasons, you don't want other virtual machines on that same box where, that, where your compute platform is running. You want to have that box all to yourself. And of course, the other ones there, um, something that I'm seeing a lot of is a, a huge demand for Hadoop and, and big data. And so Ironic is a way that we can uh, deploy those things uh, quite successfully. Well, you've probably heard enough from me babbling on about why you want Ironic and from Andy about why you want OpenStack Ansible Ironic. So let's just get straight down to it. Now, how do I get this thing running today? And uh, here's just a few command lines showing just how simple it is to enable OpenStack Ironic uh, in um, OpenStack Ansible. These commands are to set up an all-in-one. And for those not familiar with OpenStack Ansible, I just need to, just to set the scene of what this is. This is a, uh, a deployment of OpenStack running in containers on a single node. It's all of your OpenStack services on a single node. And this isn't something that you would want to do in a production environment, right? Just want to make that really clear. Don't go home and do this for your uh, you know, Fortune 500 company. This is, this is not the way you deploy OpenStack for a large company, right? But if you're a developer and you want to do some development and test, this is perfect for you to, tr to try out Ironic and to try out the different, Ironic, uh, different OpenStack services. So really, it is as simple as uh, cloning the Git repository for OpenStack Ansible. Then I've got a very nasty uh, sed command line there on line four. But all that's doing is adding in uh, the ironic.yaml.aio file to the, uh, the bootstrap aio.yaml file. And that's just going to uh, enable the creation of some LXC containers for the Ironic software to run in. After we do that, we just bootstrap Ansible. Uh, we then configure Nova by simply adding that one line there to saying that the Nova vert type is ironic. And what that will do is it will tell Nova not to set up KVM or some other hypervisor, but to use ironic instead. So you add that into user variables. And after you do that, it simply uh, is as easy as telling OpenStack Ansible, go away and set up everything. And uh, you come back a little bit later, and you've got a whole uh, OpenStack deployment ready to go. So what does this give you? This actually gives you. Um, it gives you a whole bunch of containers running OpenStack services, all separated out. It uh, configures up the network for you. It configures up Pixie Boot. It configures up DHCP. Uh, and uh, here's just a few commands just to verify that. So we can do an LXC LS to list the containers. We can see that it's created uh, an ironic API container and also an ironic conductor container. 
we can see there, uh, and then the next thing down, if you look down in lines eight onwards, what it's doing is uh, you're attaching to the utility container, and after you've attached to that, you can source your credentials, and you can do things like doing an ironic driver list. And what that's actually doing is proving that the, uh, the ironic API, the ironic conductor, the database, the RabbitMQ is all configured up and working. So it's just a, a way of verifying that it's all working. Further to that, uh, some of the things that it's uh, doing, as I mentioned just a moment ago, I've already said most of these things, but it configures up uh, the ironic API to sit behind mod WSGI. Um, it sets up Neutron for DHCP. It gets Glance and Swift ready to store both the user image and deployment image. And uh, it'll, it'll uh, set up your Galera database cluster uh, so that it's ready to go with Ironic as well as RabbitMQ. Of course, when you're talking about setting this up in such a simple way, there are some choices and limitations that, have, uh, that come with that. And so one thing that we did is that we uh, made use of the uh, agent, APMI, agent A IPMI tool driver for Ironic. Now, the reason why we chose that particular driver, and see, Ironic supports a large number of drivers, which, which are hardware specific. But we chose the, the, the lowest common denominator version. And the reason we did that is because that allows us to use IPMI to do power control, and it allows us to pixie boot as well. You can have drivers that are very uh, hardware specific. So if you've got Dell equipment, you can use a, a driver that interfaces to the DRAC. If you've got HP equipment, you can get one that interfaces to ILO. But for our first version of this in uh, the OS Ironic role, uh, we've just configured it to use Agent IPMI tool. One of the limitations we have is regarding um, single tenancy. And this is actually an artifact of where things were upstream uh, in the projects we're using, both in, uh, in Ironic and in Nova and in Neutron. You see, uh, when we were developing this, we were, we were doing it in the Liberty release, and we didn't have multi-tenant networking at that time. And so we didn't have the ability to do uh, network separation. And what this means is that, really for a, secu from, for a security uh, reasons, you would only want to uh, have single tenancy uh, deployments. That is, you only want to deploy Ironic nodes for a single customer or a single project. And the reason for that is because otherwise you have these multiple nodes, and if different, cu different customers are all using them simultaneously, they're on the same network segment, and that's not great from a security perspective. So that was a limitation in the upstream projects, but um, I'm happy to say that going forward that's, that's changed, and so we re will reincorporate that into this. The other thing is, is that because it was single tenancy, we didn't set up the cleaning network. Um, that's now a, a work item that we're going to have to do uh, in the future. The other thing there, on the middle column there, talking about hardware, you know, to, writing software that interfaces to hardware presents its own set of challenges. Hardware by nature is actually unreliable. It's flaky. Things fail unexpectedly. So what you do is you, uh, you, you know, Andy and I would write some code. We'd, de we'd attempt deploying hardware. Uh, to ha we'd attempt deploying uh, to a node, and then it would fail. Now, why did it fail? Did it fail because of a mistake in the code that we wrote? Is, was it because there was a bug in some of the other software that we're consuming, or was it because there was a problem with the disk controller, or there was a temporary network outage, or something like that? So. It's a bit of a round trip, right? You then go away and you make more changes and you, and you try it again, or you sit, spend some time debugging through that. Uh, hardware is typically unreliable. Uh, and it's not just that, it's also even software is unreliable. We came across some problems where you couldn't, uh, couldn't attach, but it couldn't talk between several nodes. And it came down to, it was a network MTU problem. Um, Neutron was flipping our uh, MT, MTU value on us. And so what this really does is it adds to the deployment cycle time. It takes, it takes a long loop to start again and redeploy to hardware again. You see, when you deploy to hardware, you, uh, you turn the machine on, it does a post, you then do a, uh, you do a DHCP request, you get back an IP address, you start the Pixie boot project a pro a process, you then download an image for the deployment, you then, that image running there on the machine will then download its own image and then write it to disk, and that might take a while to write to disk and then it will reboot again, and then you see whether it actually works. And of course, if it didn't work, start again. And of course, that process might take five minutes or so, or even longer. And so, it's a lot slower process as compared to maybe, say, developing to VMs. We also found that um, 
very small differences in hardware can actually uh, trip you up when you're developing software as well. And what it meant is that when you do this kind of testing, it's manual testing. You're manually, manually running some software and uh, deploying and seeing what happens. It's not automated. So when you're developing, uh, say, some other OpenStack software, uh, you're able to test very quickly using VMs, and it's just software-based only. But when you're doing it with hardware, it's a manual testing process. And so the corollary to that is that you can't uh, set things up without a fair bit of effort, so it happens automatically. You know, if I was writing some software that was, didn't touch hardware, I could just, every time I make a change, I could run the set of unit tests, verify it works, and I'm, all ha and I'm happy with that. When you're coming to uh, deploy with hardware, it's a bit of a, a longer time cycle before you can get those things back. And of course, that has consequences uh, when it comes to gate testing. Once all this is working, and, I'm, and I've checked it into the repository, and I'm making it available for others to use, it really is important to be able to test that end-to-end, uh, -end, but it's hard to do that uh, without having uh, hardware available to do gate testing. So we got to the bit where we now needed to implement Ironic in OpenStack Ansible, and we were starting our journey off. And Michael had actually started it already by himself and was trying to get it implemented, and he reached out for help from the, from the OpenStack Ansible team. Um, it was a bit of a difficult time in OpenStack Ansible to be implementing a new role. It was mostly due to the fact that in the Liberty cycle, we had one massive repository called OpenStack Ansible where all the roles lived. Um, but as we went to implement this role, it was the Metaka cycle, and we'd started uh, moving roles into their own repositories. This meant that we could no longer put the ironic role in its own repository. It had, a, or rather, we couldn't put the ironic role in the OpenStack Ansible repository. We had to get its own repository, um, which is a great idea. And, and the, the move has now happened, and it was the right decision, and, and it now works a lot better. But it meant that we were innovating a lot of the things that happened, because no new roles had been implemented as their own roles. Um, We'd come in in the morning, and, and Michael would have already set up some of the kind of database services and the Keystone services, and the way in which um, the project wanted them to be done would have changed. So we spent a lot of time spinning our wheels on things that were actually not related to Ironic at all. They were related to how the project works and how, um, how that should happen. Um, with that came the dependencies between the OpenStack Ansible repository and the Ironic role itself. Um, and more importantly, the OpenStack um, roles and the OpenStack Ironic uh, role repository. So for example, Ironic's quite special in that it, it needs quite a few uh, dependencies. It requires Nova, Keystone, and Glance. Um, and then it also requires Swift on top of that to, to do a temp URL, which is where it will um, put a temporary URL for the image that it's going to get from Glance. Um, so we had to somehow uh, figure out how we were going to namespace variables, which hadn't been done yet within the project, all the, at the same time trying to implement um, Ironic in, in a useful way. And so it, it really put blockers up that, um, that if they hadn't been there, I think we could have got through this a bit quicker. Um, and then the last point was that since we'd now moved to individual roles, we needed uh, individual role testing. Um, and as Michael said before, it's quite hard to, to get um, Ironic testing if you don't have specific hardware to, hardware to test against. Um, and at that point in, in the Ironic lifecycle, even Ironic Upstream didn't have that. Um, so we had to settle for some API tests, which is not a great test of functionality. It, it tests that you've deployed it, and it tests that the API is responding correctly. But it doesn't really test that all the connectors between um, the bit where you would make the API call and, and where the host that you would like to be spun up actually happens. So um, we had a couple of challenges around that. Um, so the technical challenges um, that we faced, um, so like I said, we had to split out a new role. We had to try implement a new role that uh, we were struggling with um, some of the hardware challenges that, that Michael had talked about. But we also had to refactor it all the time. So we, we're refactoring the role and, and trying to fit into a new system that isn't quite there yet um, and then deal with all the changes that are going on within the project. Um, so that, that was pretty difficult. Um, and then the physical hardware requirements um, it's really important for us, like since uh, the project got implemented, since the OpenStack Ironic role got implemented, we've had a couple bugs that have come in that could easily have been avoided if we had a legitimate gating on uh, some kind of hardware, or at least a, a faked hardware. Um, and at the time, in the, in the Liberty Cycle, that, that didn't exist. Um, and so, so we had that kind of problem to contend with. There are also some uh, pretty big non-technical challenges, uh, which were interesting. Um, for starters, I'm, I've been working on uh, deployment projects for the last four or so years. I was uh, part of the OpenStack 
Chef project for a while, um, and we had our own deployment tool set before that, um, and then I moved on to do OpenStack Ansible. So I've been doing deployments a lot, but my knowledge of Ironic uh, extended as far as knowing what it is and kind of how it works, but not very much past that. So to kind of understand how the networks all fit together and how all the, the kind of uh, various uh, pieces of the puzzle fit together was, was a little bit difficult for me. And my challenge was is that I didn't know Ansible at all, and I had no experience with the OpenStack Ansible project either. So, uh, but on the other side, you know, I was very familiar with Ironic, and uh, so we had this this thing where Andy had half of the puzzle and I had the other half of the puzzle, um, and there was uh, some more challenges as well. Yeah, I mean. When we look at, at that kind of challenge, it, it's interesting because, like I said, Michael had actually started trying to do it in Ansible before I even came along. And, and some of the stuff he'd done, he'd, he'd rewritten the way we did databases. He'd, he'd rewritten a RabbitMQ server. And, and for someone, it, it seems so simple for someone who works on the project every day to just be like, well, we've got a role for that. Just run the role, and there's your database. Like, you don't have to do anything. But as far as he was concerned, he was being told to make this you know, split out project. We were doing role split out. It needed to run as its own kind of thing. Um, so obviously, Ironic needs a database. So I should run the database in the Ironic role. Um, so it, it was that kind of thing where we managed to speed it up really quickly as soon as, uh, as, soon as we both got on board and, and working together. Um, and it was interesting because, as Michael said, he's, he's from Australia, and I'm based in the UK. So there's a roughly a 12-hour time gap. And uh, at first, it was quite hard. So, I, there were a lot of late night meetings and early morning meetings for both of us, um, and to get a kind of good cadence going was quite difficult. Um, but by the end of it, we had actually got it down quite well. I'd uh, have a meeting at just before I went to bed to tell Michael where I was at um, and what I thought we should do next and what needed to be done. And in the morning, I'd get up and stuff would have been done, and I'd now have to look at what needed to be uh, moved along from there. And it actually worked really well once you kind of embraced the fact that you're not going to be working at the same time and you're not going to have uh, the ability to just you know, do the same things at the same time. Um, and, and in the end of the day, we actually took advantage of that, I'd say, rather than um, let it slow us down. Um, so the hardware lab availability, um, we've mentioned like the requirement for hardware to test and to, to install stuff. But one of the non-technical things about that is that getting hardware is a slow process. If you go to your organization and say, we need 10 servers to deploy things on, um, it typically takes a long time, even at at the best organizations, it, it takes time. They have to get the servers from somewhere and rack them in a data center and, and do all those things that are pretty normal, but the, the, the lead time is, is quite high. Um, with Ironic, it's slightly worse, for us at least, because it wasn't a standard configuration. Um, in Ironic, you need your IPMI devices, so the DRACs or the ILOs or whatever else you have in your hardware, to, to sit on a network that can be uh, connected to from the Ironic services. Um, and normally, we segregate those out so that you can't connect to them um, unless you're on a specific network uh, for security reasons. So it meant that it was like a snowflake configuration that we're now asking for. I um, mean, it took quite a long time to get meaningful hardware. And in the meantime, we were trying to run around and get you know, special hardware set up on the side, like on the sly, and, and so that we can just get something going and test things. And it, that was possibly one of the most frustrating things we had. And all the while this is happening, we've got customers that want this now. So they want what we're trying to do. And we've got time constraints. We can't you know, sit around waiting for two months doing nothing while hardware is being deployed somewhere. It's, 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 a challenging, um, it's a challenge that you have to overcome in, in a lot of projects. And um, fortunately, we had a, had a couple of workarounds and we were able to, to get stuff done. But it, it's, it's definitely something that you need to be aware of when you come across these things. And then the last non-technical challenge is around um, when we went to deploy. So I, I already mentioned that we started splitting out the roles in OpenStack Ansible, um, which was an important task, and, and it was really great. But we had our stable deployment for customers running on Liberty, which would have been in the time frame when we still had the one big repo. Now, implementing a new project in OpenStack Ansible would count as a feature, so we can't backport it to Liberty. And even if we could backport it to Liberty, we'd have to somehow take the single role and get it either pushed into the main role, or basically, we, we weren't too sure how to do this. Like, we've got a customer we need to have a supportable release, but we have to build this thing on master. So how do we challenge, how do we tackle that? So we decided to do both. Um, we started off with building, uh, building the OpenStack Ironic role on Metaka with the split out role repos, and we got everything working there. And then once we had it working, uh, we used a, a bit of glue and created a, 
a branch for Liberty, uh, for Ironic, that would then uh, integrate with the one repository in OpenStack Ansible. Um, so it, it took a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of work and a little bit of um, outside the box thinking around getting, getting the variables to play nicely together. Um, but at the end of the day, we managed to build the, build the project for, but not with Liberty. And of course, now I'm much better at doing Git merges. <laughs> So one of the key points is that we needed to add a new role to OpenStack Ansible, and it, it's, it's really important to me um, that, that this becomes an easy process. We obviously faced quite a few hurdles. It was mostly around timing, I would say. If, if we'd done the project a cycle earlier or a cycle later, we, we wouldn't have had the same issues. But I'd like it to be in a state where that doesn't happen and where a new project can come on board in OpenStack and say, hey, OpenStack Ansible is a cool project. We should have an automated deployment in that project. Um, and so we've put a lot of effort, and we're going to continue to put a lot of effort into making that easy for, uh, for projects to come on and, and get involved. Um, so one of the things we've done is we've uh, made a standardized configuration around how you set up your central services. So it's now more clear that when I set up my database, when I set up my uh, Keystone users and endpoints, and when I set up my RabbitMQQs, um, that they, that happens in a certain way. And you can look at all the other roles, and they all do it the same way. And so having a standard is really important, because you're not just you know, running around trying to figure it out yourself. It's already there. Don't worry about it. Worry about deploying your own stuff. Um, and then the centralized testing repo. So we, we've created a centralized testing repo, which basically contains a whole bunch of playbooks um, that deploy the very servers you would need. So for example, if you're de uh, developing a new role and you want to add it to OpenStack Ansible, and your role relies on Keystone or Glance or Nova, you don't have to think about how you do that. You don't have to write your own little playbook to, to use the Keystone role. You can just use the existing one, which also comes with a bunch of pre-populated variables based on the inventory that you specify, and it'll just deploy it for you. So it's as simple as including the playbook that does the install Keystone or install Glance, and away you go. And then you can focus on your role only and not worry about the rest of it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's a lot about you know, creating clear standards. We, we'd like to add more documentation and, and uh, you know, some things around what we expect from a new role, like what we want to see from a new role. When you come in, we have to see testing. We have to see this. We have to see that and whatever the requirements we, we decide upon. But um, we've already started to create the, the standardized approach to how you would do things. Cool. So that brings us to, uh, you know, I'm sorry we've had to uh, share some warts with you, some of the problems that we faced. But now, where do we go from here? What are our next steps? So things that we need to do. So something that we've been working on is getting uh, virtual lab gating working. So what that means is uh, the Ironic project makes use of something called uh, virtual BMC, which allows you to use uh, uh, this little bit of software, virtual BMC, uh, to power control QMU VM images and make it appear like hardware. So it means that Ironic doesn't need to change. It can just send IPMI commands. And what we can do then is we can power cycle and we can bring up a QMU uh, virtual machine image. Uh, we can then, if we set up our networks correctly, we can pixie boot that image. And so what it allows us to do is we have pretend hardware. So this, these problems that I talked about earlier, uh, about how we needed to have hardware to do this thing and how we would like this to be automated, that's getting much closer to us. Uh, I will say we're not quite there yet, but you know, it's, it's only this much. It's only that much more to go and then we'll be set. Uh, the, the good news is, is that the, uh, the Ironic project itself uh, is starting to do that for gating, and so we're, um, uh, we've got, uh, someone's already forged the path ahead in front of us. Once we have that, of course, the real benefit is, is we can have that set up in our, in our gate, in the uh, OpenStack Ansible Ironic role, such that any future changes will have to go through that proper gate test, so it'll stop any regressions coming in, hopefully. Uh, it'll also allow us to do refactoring and to, and to make other changes as well to make sure that everything still holds together how it should. The other thing that we want to do is that we want to make things easier for operators. You see, what we've got today is an ironic role, which is quite good for if, you, if you're prepared to have uh, an, an operator be handheld or perhaps a very technically uh, clever operator uh, to use this. They can go and use that today, and that's fine. But if we want wider adoption, we really need to make it easier for an operator to make use of. Part of that is, is simply making it easier to enable ir the ironic role. Uh, another thing is to improve the documentation. We've got some great uh, documentation people involved uh, in the project. But what we need to do is uh, document how to set up networks, because ironic is quite special. We have networks for power control, for the IPMI. Uh, we have a provisioning network for Pixie. 
uh, we need a network for cleaning. Uh, and, and cleaning is about, uh, since you've uh, provisioned a node and you've handed that over to someone with an image on it, when they hand it back, you want to go through a process of cleaning that node and making sure it's ready for redeployment again. So we need to make sure that the cleaning network is set up. So there really is, uh, and especially if you're talking about a multi-node setup, not just a little develop and test network, uh, there is a bit of configuration that's needed. So we need to improve the documentation to make it easy for operators. The other thing we need to do is that because we were doing this to a deadline and doing this uh, as, a, as a first cut, uh, there are a number of things that we left out. We left out the, uh, the web UI. We left out Ironic Inspector. These are things that are uh, really needed to add back in. Uh, these are things that Ironic provides today, but we don't have as part of this role. The other couple of things is, again, making it easy for operators, and part of that's got to do with node enrollment. You see, when you want to uh, deploy to a physical node, there are things that you need about that node that you need to tell uh, Ironic about. Things like the MAC address that you want to pixie boot on, about the IPMI credentials. Uh, these things need to be, and you, uh, Manually, you can enter those in via a CLI. You can go ironic node create, and you can add all those on. But, and that's fine for a little test and, and development. Andy and I were able to do that when we're testing with you know, half a dozen nodes. But if you're starting to use this to deploy 1,000 nodes or 10,000 nodes, obviously, you don't want to be typing in those command lines. It'd be far better to have Ansible playbook support to enroll large numbers of nodes. Likewise, hardware is flaky. Uh, I think you probably see that there's a bit of a theme here. Uh, things go wrong. And so when things go wrong, Ironic has the idea of a rescue mode. And we want to have a playback, playbook support to be able to help boot that node into a rescue, uh, rescue image to help uh, diagnose what the problem is. And so then we can get that node up and running again. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other features that Ironic has that are not essential, but are very useful. Uh, and there's a few of them listed on the screen there. Serial console, rather than actually physically having to go to a console to see that over, over the wire. Uh, IPXC, uh, root device hinting, uh, config drive, partition images, all kinds of other things that are uh, things that Ironic uh, enables, are enabled uh, there, but we haven't got variables for inside of the Ansible role uh, to include as well. The other thing that we want to do is we want to keep up with Ironic. You see, uh, Ironic is a very active project. There's a lot of things happening upstream. And we want to make sure that we incorporate those changes and benefit from those things as part of the Ironic role in OpenStack Ansible. The first one there is Nova multi-compute hosts. You see, at the moment, there's a, there's a single point of failure between Nova and Ironic. Um, the, that interface needs improving uh, to uh, improve the resiliency. Now, that, there's some great work being uh, done right now in this area. There's some that's happened in the cycle that we've just finished and some happening in this new cycle. But we want to improve the HA of that interface. And so as soon as that happens, we want to incorporate that uh, in this work here. Uh, obviously, that will make it easier for operators. And the next one there is uh, Nova Cells V2. And the reason why we want Nova Cells V2 is to make it easy to mix both virtual machines, containers, and bare metal nodes as part of the one OpenStack deployment. Again, behind that one OpenStack API. Now, it's not actually, uh, we've got a colleague, uh, Kevin Carter, and he's actually doing work at the moment in this space uh, to prove that you don't have to do it in Nova Cells. Uh, but either we go that way or whether we use Nova Cells v2, uh, the reality is, is that we just want to be able to deploy virtual machine instances and bare metal nodes together as part of the one OpenStack install. Uh, we want, there's been some great improvements in Ironic in serial console support. Uh, in cleaning, in multi-tenant networking, like I discussed earlier. Uh, we want to have these things incorporated in as they become available in Ironic. And of course, that will be much easier to do once we have uh, a virtual gate. So that really brings us to this, uh, this slide here, looking forward and moving, looking back and moving forward. Close, close. That's what I did in, um, <laughs> that's what I did in practice too. Uh, there you go. So this is, the, um, this is the console from the DeLorean in Back to the Future. Uh, so uh, hopefully in this talk you've seen uh, the journey that we started about uh, two guys who, who uh, needed to work together uh, with Ironic and OpenStack Ansible to bring it together to add this Ironic role. Uh, you've seen that we've had some problems, uh, but we've now got this thing and it's working. But the reality is, is there's still lots more to do as I've shown in the last couple of slides. Uh, what we'd like to see is we'd like to see some operators make use of OpenStack Ansible Ironic to deploy and give us some real world feedback. Maybe that's you here today. Maybe you can give that a try in, some, in, a, in a network and, and let us know how that goes. 
Or maybe you're a developer and you can say, hey, I can, I'm quite happy to add in some of those new features that you talked about. So it's, in some ways, it's a bit of a call to arms. You know, we, we, you know patch is welcome. We would, we would like your involvement to, uh, to help us uh, make this something that people really want to use. Yeah. And on that note, um, tomorrow uh, morning, there's actually a fishbowl for the OpenStack Ansible um, team. And, and it's around uh, new projects that may want to get involved, uh, new developers who want to get involved in the project. So if you have any feedback or if there's anything you'd like to know or, or anything you want to you know, tell us, please come along. Um, we're pretty, pretty friendly, mostly. Cool. <laughs> Um, they're just some attributions for the photos that you've seen. That brings us to some questions that we're quite happy to take from you now. And uh, just finally, I'll put this slide up. It's just a QR code, which is a link to the slides and um, things that we talked about today. So if you want more information, uh, go to that URL or uh, grab the QR code. Otherwise, uh, we'll take uh, any questions from you. Do you deploy the TFTP uh, HTTP servers on conductors also in separate containers? So, so what uh, we do uh, is... Um, HTTP probably not because you're not supporting IPXA, right? Uh, uh, sorry, repeat. Uh, HTTP server not because you're not supporting IPXA right now, but TFTP you deploy in a separate container, right? Yeah. Uh, well, in the, uh, the TFTP runs in the ironic conductor uh, container, at least, uh, okay. at, least the, at least the version they have here for the all-in-one. Um, okay. When you start to scale that out, we can move that around. Okay. Thank you cool. very much, everyone. Thanks very much. <laughs>